It is great to be here with you, and uh, welcome again to those who are new students. We're so glad that you're here. We have a few new spring semester students here, and we're so thankful. And it's great to be a part of uh, this worship. I notice we have more lights here, and the blue backdrop. Wow, things are really getting high tech here, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, as uh, Dr. Primer mentioned, um, this is the start of a series. Uh, I actually did this series in Wilmore. It was an eight-part series. So we're reducing it down to three so that we are kind of constrained a bit. But uh, we also are going to have talkback sessions afterwards and lunch provided. So any question you have, we can have open interaction uh, all over all these themes uh, in the times I'm down here. Um, we're living in a, in, a, in a time with a, you might call it a multi-generational neglect of a proper theology and biblical vision of the body of marriage and human sexu sexuality. And the church's uh, inability in recent years to articulate any kind of compelling response to a lot of the challenge, particularly things like same-sex marriage or gender reassignment, has really revealed this. Um, it, it shows that we have a lot of work to do. Um, it's grossly in, um, uh, ineffective and insufficient, both, for us to simply be against things. Right, I, we 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 just we can't. And the reason we are just known as being those who are against things is because we don't know what else to say, right? That's the problem. And so we have to have been articulate. Okay, well, if we're against something, what are we for? You know, what is the grand biblical vision? What is the glorious kind of truth that we want to invite people into, in which the biblical vision call, summons us into? What is the joyful alternative? You might say. Um, I have read a lot on this issue, but I've never uh, found anything quite as good as the work by the late John Paul II, uh, Man and Woman, He Created Them a Theology of the Body. If you haven't read this book, run to your nearest Amazon outlet, you know, and get it. I read this, and there, by the way, there's jillions of versions of this. There's like, you know, the, this is like the full strength version. There's the like, you know, Theology of the Body for Idiots, Theology of the Body for Children. The of, you know, they have all those versions of it. People who explain it to you and all that. But if you just want to read it, here it is. But this represents um, the work of John Paul II. And if you don't know his story, he actually uh, dedicated um, such a Catholic thing. You know, he decided to dedicate some homilies to the issue of a theology of the body. He started on September 5th, 1979. And he lectured every Wednesday on it until November 28th, 1984. This is what I call the five-year series. You know, when, when our, in our tradition, if you do more than three, people get nervous. You know, more than three sermons on a, one theme. But it's unbelievable, five years on this theme. And this is the collection of those homilies that are found in this book. And when I read this, I, I was astounded uh, by so many things that we can draw from. And one of the great things about the Wesleyan tradition that I love is that the Wesleyan tradition is what we call a synthesis tradition, which means Wesley didn't like, he didn't build up walls and say, no, no, we, we, can't, you know, we can't learn from them or them. He's like, no, we, we want to learn. We, we want to learn from uh, every tradition. Wesley draws from the Puritans. Uh, he draws from the uh, Roman Catholics, the Orthodox, from every tradition. So what we actually, what the Wesleyan tradition actually is, is a synthesis of all the good stuff that everybody else has. And we bring it together and eliminate all the weaknesses. That's why we have this tremendous tradition. It's a synthesis tradition. That's a little biased, but that's kind of my view on it. <laughs> but it is true that, you know, what would happen if we really took time to think through these issues well? And I often joke, and this is an overstatement, I get it, but I often joke that when somebody says, well, how do you compare Roman Catholic and Protestant theologizing? Especially on issues like, like, you know, bubbling up social cultural issues that are in our society today or any day. Things like, you know, human sexuality or, you know, nuclear armaments or, you know, global immigration or, you know, you name the issue. This is what happens. In the Roman Catholic world, the Pope will call in his Jesuits and say, you know, we have this problem of, you know, uh, immigration or, you know, human sexuality. Um, go out and, and uh, work on this and come back in 10, 10 or 20 years and give me a full report. And then he'll produce an encyclical about it, and you know, they go on from there. In the Protestant world, we're literally writing down our thoughts on the back of an envelope and back of a car on our way to a rally to address the issue. Okay? I hope you get my point. 
uh, the Protestant tradition, because we're such an activistic tradition, you know, we're out to save the world, and by the way, let's do it today. You know, we tend to be much more focused on practical answers, pastoral answers, the quick solutions, and we don't often take time to really think through things well until we get into difficulties, and this is the difficulty we're in today. So uh, what we found uh, when you look at the scriptures that were read today is discussions about marriage and family and sexuality and so forth are not at all new. We think that this is a new issue for us. It's not a new issue for us. What is new is our unpreparedness to give any coherent answer to what's proposed to us. And it's way too simplistic to think that like, our real goal in, these, in this series or even in our ministry is if we can just come up with like, a really clever argument, you know, six reasons why we think homosexual, homosexual practice is wrong, we would really have arrived. That is not the goal of this, this series. That is not the, the goal of where, where the church needs to be. We have a lot of things we need to answer to that and many other issues. But until you lay a proper foundation and understand the design of the whole thing and the role of the human body, then all of these things make no sense and we can't actually get it. In fact, one of the things I think is really important is that, especially in relationship to homosexual practice, is that one of the problems with that issue in particular is that we've isolated it out. You know, we made it like this thing that we debate about and fight about and argue about. Rather than looking and seeing it within a whole cultural landscape of sexual brokenness and human brokenness that spans everything from digital pornography to adultery to fornication, divorce, gender reassignment, uh, and more recently, now, more recently, this disabling uh, community that dis dis purposely disables themselves. So all these problems that are emerging in our society are really rooted out of a theology of the body. And one of the mistakes we made in our quick back on the envelope is we assumed that the current arguments were about sex. They're not about sex. Sex is a presenting issue. The real deep issue behind all of this is this is a, this is a big fight over the body. And this, as you'll see as this series develops, this has enormous Im Im uh, implications for being a woman in our society today. The ways our society conspires to shame women with their bodies is unbelievable. It has nothing to do with same-sex marriage. I mean, there's so many issues. This is Black History Month. What, what this has done to, to rekindle racial tension in our country because of our view of the body. This has enormous implications beyond the kind of things that we want quick answers for. So I kind of consider, put ourselves kind of like the, um, the schoolboy who complains that he failed the exam, but, oh, he never actually studied for it. We're kind of like that. I hate to say it, you know, because you hate, you know, it's always good to always say we did our best, but this is where we're actually having done our best. We're like the schoolboy who complains that the culture gave us a test and we flunked it, but we never actually studied. We never actually prepared for it. We live in a culture where all these things that we knew were true were kind of accepted as true, and when the culture no longer believed they were true anymore, we didn't know what to say. And so when the Pharisees uh, come to Jesus in our uh, text and they ask him this question, and this is a great insight in the way Jesus does this a lot, where they say, in this case, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? It's very interesting how Jesus responds to questions in general, isn't it? Have you ever had the feeling, that when you, especially John's Gospel, when you read, a Jesus asks a question, then you read the answer, and you're like, huh? I, it doesn't seem to match. Jesus doesn't always answer the questions that are asked him. Because Jesus always looks beyond the question to the questioner. All right? It's one of the cr classic things that Jesus understands. So Jesus not only hears the question, and it, it was, it, this would be like a moderate, in some ways when they say, is it right to divorce, for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? It's a very modern question, isn't it? It almost comes across as a question you heard last Tuesday. You know, like, what are the grounds, you know, what are the things we can do till we can dismiss this relationship? Come on, Jesus, yes or no, give me a yes or no answer. Jesus doesn't give a yes or no answer. Jesus comes back and says to him, well, you know, twice in the text, it wasn't that way from the beginning. You know, he's got all the reasons why Moses did this, Moses did this. And Jesus says, we've got to go back to the beginning. That, that, the title of this particular homily is, let's go back to the beginning. 
But what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees in their situation, and he would say it to ours, I'm confident, is before you answer these questions, is it right for a woman to marry another woman? Is it right for a man to decide that he really is a woman inside and, a, and go through a gender reassignment? These are, these are questions that are asked. These are no longer theoretical questions, right? These are, these are the stuff of like, you know, modern day stuff. Uh, before we answer the question, just go back to the beginning. Now, if you go back to the, to the beginning, to Genesis text, and you look at the early uh, few chapters that were read, some that were read today, and you look at things about, well, how is the, pro- how, what are the Protestants, like, what have they mined from Genesis 1, 2, and 3? If you think, if you look at theology, and of course Brian's here, he can testify to this, and other faculty here, uh, you know, if you look at the, um, the biblical, really, Brian is the, the, not the professor of, if I'm wrong, please correct me publicly here, but not New Testament or Old Testament, he's the professor of the whole Bible, right? The whole Bible, he's got it. So here he is, <laughs> on the front row. I mean, we encounter professors of, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, professors of Pauline literature, professors of, you know, the, you got the whole Bible, man. All right, so if you go, to the, go back to the early Bible, and you uh, look at how do Protestants theologically deal with the first few chapters. Basically, they almost always deal with it in terms of the phys- physicality of creation, you know, creation debates, uh, things about evolution. I mean, you know, you're familiar with all of these arguments on various pers- perspectives on Genesis 1 to 3. What we very rarely see it talked about is u- using it as a discussion of this issue. And he spends uh, dozens of his early homilies looking at that point. What can we learn from the early, early period? By the way, this is why false teaching is good for the church. Uh, Paul even says this. Whenever we have false teaching, uh, we see it as bad, but God sees it as good. And that sounds horrible. Don't very quote that. Don't, don't take that out of my sermon and put that on the placard. False teaching is bad for the church. <laughs> but it's good for the church in the sense that it forces us to go back to the Bible and reread things and study things and learn things and realize what we messed up. This is a great example of that. So Jesus very, very amazingly brings together Genesis 1.27, how God created his male and female, and he joins it with Genesis 2.24, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and become in one flesh. And what happens in the way Jesus deals with Matthew 19 is that he is showing us that the categories of male and female being created as man and as woman these are not mere biological categories. Or let me say it more bluntly. These are not mere functional categories. What he's introducing to us is these are deeply theological categories. These are reflective of God himself. And we're in fleshed realities that are very, very deeply, deeply uh, embedded in our life. Now, if we think about our experience, honestly, and I, one of the things I did as I read this book, I try to be honest about my own perceptions about things and how I was raised and my just view of the church. And what I basically concluded, and I hope, I think you'd probably agree with me, is that basically the Christian church, particularly in the Western world, has largely embraced the wider cultural views about marriage. All right, now this is something that happened decades ago. All right, so you know, we planted seeds decades ago, they now have grown up. But the fact is, if you look at the culture and you were to talk, stop, you know, 100 people out here on the street and say, what, what's the purpose of marriage? They would say things like this. Well, to make you happy. It's to promote companionship. Uh, sexual fulfillment would be mentioned in various ways. And, of course, economic efficiency. So in the Western world, it's just a fact that marriage has become a commodity. You know, it's something that you enter into that you get something out of it. In this case, you get, for example, maybe... You, exp- you, you get emotional returns in your life. And of course, because it's the modern world and it's a commodity, if you don't like it, it doesn't work out, you're not getting the returns on it that you thought you would get, then of course you can discard it. Go get another one. That's the world we live in. So we live in a world that has commodified marriage and the church has kind of accepted that idea. We, if you talk to Christians and say, well, why would you get married? Well, emotional fulfillment, sexual fulfillment, it helps me economically, I get the I joint tax return, whatever. The same kind of things are said. And so the question is, what, what happened to the deeper vision about reflecting the Trinity, the sacramental nature of the body, 
being image bearers of God, not just in our spirits, which we've done so much to develop, but in our bodies, our very physicality, has huge implications for our theology. You know, we think that the immigration problem is like a technical problem. This is, these are people's bodies. Syrian refugees, these are people, right? I mean, the implications this has for so many issues are profound. The power of self-donation. Where is that in the modern world? The, the, uh, the idea of actually becoming a co-creator with God. We, in, in, the, in the marriage act, we actually we give birth to children. Our, we actually become co-creators with God in bearing children. Wow. What a, what a, even also, our physicality being created male and female, already preparing for the day when the incarnation would come, where God himself would show up in a body. It's remarkable. All of that has not been a prominent part of even popular books on Christian marriage and so forth in our culture. So once the culture, once we've accepted the wider cultural views about marriage, and uh, we kind of accepted a social, biological, functional, practical, pragmatic kind of view of the whole thing, then we had lost the theological vision that Genesis gives us and Jesus reminds us to look back to. And we actually find ourselves, we don't really have an argument. I, actually, once you lose that, once you accept the utilitarian view rather than the covenantal view of marriage, then we actually have no basis to say anything, why anything could be actually resisted. We have no argument at all. So our problem is actually very, very deep indeed. It's not just about whether someone can be married if they're the same sex. It's about our own marriages. It's about us. It's our problem. We look in the mirror. It's us. We have to really think about whether we have a biblical vision for marriage in our own lives. And by the way, this has to do with singleness and celibacy. It has to do with all of these issues. We'll spend a whole week just on singleness later on. So, okay, uh, so part of the, what we find in this is that we're looking at really a sacramental uh, reality. A sacrament we define as an outward and spiritual sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And one of the things that Wesley did that was beautiful was that Wesley actually didn't really fully accept the idea that the Protestants have propagated that there's only two sacraments, you know, uh, the, the last uh, Eucharist and the baptism. But Wesley was trying to work within the Reformation framework, so he brought in this wonderful theology of what we call today the means of grace. And it opened up. So one of the problems with our view of sacraments is that we ask the wrong question. We say, what, what, are, the only, what are the sacraments that are instituted by Christ? And the answer is, well, baptism and Lord's Supper. And even the Roman Catholics agree with that. There's not a, no, pro, no difference on that point. The problem is, would we ever ask the other question, would any sacraments possibly flow from other members of the Trinity? Have you ever thought about that? Wesley did. Could the Holy Spirit actually be the progenitor of sacraments? We think about laying on of hands on this for the sick, for example. Ordination. Things that Roman Catholics celebrate and, we, and Wesley did as, as means of grace. And of course, marriage is the primordial sacrament, isn't it? You know, that is the Father's sacrament is marriage itself. The, great, the greatest sign of what is to come. So we are bodily living sacraments. He breathed into us. And we have, we've inherited a lot of bad theology when we think about the image of God and what it means to be those who follow God. It's something that happens inside of us, into our spirits. So we, we've really got into that theology deeply, not realizing, and that's of course true, but it's also about all of who we are. Our bodies mean everything to God. That's why he's going to raise them up at the end of time. That's why Christ is the first fruits of the bodily resurrection. So ultimately, all of this gets lived out in the, in the incarnation. And the human body, as it turns out, is in fact the bridge between theology and anthropology. That is the great bridge. Without the physicality of the body, there are no means of grace. Think about it. You baptize a body. You take Eucharist into your body. You confess Christ with your lips. You lay hands on the body of sick people. You anoint them with oil on their heads. You lay hands on someone to set them apart for ministry. Even the scripture is read with our eyes or heard with our ears. Only the body can make the invisible visible. 
It is the ultimate outward sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And we have to capture that. So one of the ways that John Paul does this is by bringing to our attention something that I must admit I neglected so much my own thinking was what he calls the, the pre-fallen Adam. Now you know in the, uh, in the New Testament there's a great, great development of the two Adams. You have the, Christ, uh, the Adam uh, that falls and in the Garden of, of Eden and then you have this Christ, the second Adam that's developed in Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 where Christ is the second Adam, and he reverses all, you know, all the disobedience of the first Adam. He ret- comes back with the obedience of the second Adam. So in the first garden of uh, Eden, we are fallen. In the second garden of Gethsemane, we have this redemption of Christ, not my will, but thine be done. What John Paul, and of course, when you think about it, Jesus in our text does is say, wait a minute, don't forget to look at the pre-fallen Adam. That's a big neglect of our, of our theology. In fact, one of the criticisms of Protestant theology is that we basically, if you look at, if you look at like kind of what is the story of the gospel, how do we tell the gospel story, how do we get all this out of our mouths, what do we basically do? We have a theology that goes from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20, which means we go from fall to judgment. So, you know, Adam fell, messed everything up, we're in deep trouble, you know, God did this, God did this, the Jewish people, the law, the temple, da 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 and then eventually Christ came, he rose from the dead, and eventually he comes back and he judges the world. Now that's a, that is a very kind of classic evangelical narrative of the gospel, going from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20. But last I checked, that's why I have the Bible here, I will start Genesis 1, and goes to Revelation 22. So there's two chapters in the beginning and the end, which we've kind of lopped off, which is the real narrative is creation to new creation. All right? So we've really neglected and We've used creation to fight about evolution all, but we haven't actually really looked at the <coughs> profound theological implications of our creation as bodily beings in the image of God. So he d- begins to do this. And the fact that Jesus in Matthew 19 quotes masterfully uh, Genesis 1.27 and 2.24, both pre-fallen text, and reminds us and overturns even Moses' own concessions about divorce to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Okay, I know that all that happened because our hearts are hard, but from the beginning it was not so. Go back to the beginning. Don't miss God's original design. This is actually amazingly important for Wesleyan theology because the reason why our our doctrines are so, the reason we have a, a theology goes from Genesis 3 to Revelation 20, from fall to judgment, rather than creation of new creation, is because we have inherited a very loud Reformed theology voice which basically says the fall is so profound, the depth of sin is so great, that the whole of Genesis 1 is blown up. It's just, just a wasteland. And therefore we have to start with the, you know, we start at the bottom of the barrel, we've got to move up. But here Jesus himself says, no, no, no. He basically says, he does say, the design is still intact. In other words, even in a fallen world, God doesn't give up on the original design. Isn't that amazing? What that tells us is, okay, we live in a fallen world. There's, we live in a world of endless concessions and problems and difficulties and brokenness. And many of us, none of us maybe can they say that we experienced or do experience the perfect vision of biblical marriage and family life and all the rest. We all have our stories to tell. But, but, but Jesus says, but I'm not going to give up on the design. Because the design is the design. Don't forget what's all happened. And the fall does not change that. So Adam uh, is created, and he is uh, enabled in Genesis 2, 19 and 20, to discover his own solitude. And so he names all the animals and realizes that he's alone. This is so amazing. And this is the pre-fallen Adam we're learning from. And he, eventually, God uh, calls him into, the, of course, the deep sleep where he is given, his, given Eve. But he's recognizing early on, and even with Eve, the profound solitude, which we don't want to really talk about, that all of us have if we're not in communion with God. In fact, one of the best definitions of sin I ever read was one that said, Sin is all the ways that we elect the absence of God in our lives. Think about that. 
That's exactly what sin does. Sin isolates us. The whole trajectory of, of the fall is pushing us toward autonomous solitude. The whole trajectory of redemption is pushing us toward communion with the triune God. And the fact that we believe in the triune God is God himself inviting us into his community. He's already eternal community. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, perfect community within himself. Islam doesn't have that. That's one of the problems Islam has. And that's why if you know Islamic theology, you know that even their greatest theologians like, like Al-Ghazali and some of these tremendous, their mega theologians have said, Allah does not reveal himself. He only reveals his will. In other words, Allah can only reveal his commandments to you. All you can do, the greatest you can do with Allah is obey him. That's not the biblical vision. And we make a mistake when we, when we reduce the gospel to that. It's not about just obeying him. We have a lot of obedience to do, but it has to be birthed in knowing him, loving him. He has a much bigger vision for us. And so all of this is rolling out of this. In fact, I love the fact that in uh, C.S. Lewis, if you, if you read his great divorce, I think there's probably very few examples of a really profound insight into the nature of hell in the great divorce. Have you read the great divorce? If you remember how it ends up, how hell is described, when they, when they go into this, it's like a gray town, and everyone loses the solidity of their bodies. That's what hell is. The, you're like a ghost, and he says, the grass is so hard that you can't even walk on it. A leaf is so heavy you can't pick it up because they lost the solidity of their bodies. And yet in, the, in hell, everyone that comes into hell they're immediately, their place of dwelling gets pushed out further and further out. Everyone keeps moving out, moving out. Everyone lives thousands of miles from the nearest neighbor. And so you have this total aloneness, and yet after all is said and done, the whole of hell is nothing more than a grain of sand in size because it has no body to it, no substance to it. It's amazing imagery. Well, then, to bring some of these to a close, we, we have uh, John Paul also ask us to go back, not only to remember our original solitude, but original nakedness. It's amazing theology he does with how in the creation, when men and women are created, we're told in the text that was read, they were, they, felt, uh, they, they were naked and they felt no shame. There's another area where we have totally, what we've done theologically is wonderful, but it's just not been enough. If you look at um, how we talk about the fight, what happened in the fall, our kind of answer to that, especially evangelical world, is that we, you know, we have unleashed disobedience and therefore guilt into the world. Okay, there's a guilt problem. People are guilty of disobeying God, breaking his commandments, and therefore we're worthy of God's judgment. It's absolutely true. But in, in the actual account in Genesis, what you actually find are two additional things. Because yes, they both the command, do not eat from any tree of the garden, that's there. But there's two other things that are particularly mentioned that came out in the reading today. Mention, uh, number one, fear and shame. Now it turns out that the cross, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the fall really actually unleashed three forces in the world, guilt, fear, and shame. And this has huge implications for the human body and the way we shame each other and the way we allow shaming to happen because of bodily realities, whether it be the color of your skin or the size of your body, the shape of your body, all of the things that we do. So in the garden, when, uh, when the God confronts Adam, where are you? Loss of communion. Adam says, I hid because I was afraid. There's the fear. And I was naked. He's become self-conscious. You see, the the whole thrust of the fall is towards self-orientation, the, the movement toward this inward gaze. That's the anti-sacrament of the world of solitude. Who told you that you were naked? Well, Adam's response reveals that he's already lost the sense of communion, this new self-orientation. Who he, begins to, he blames his wife. The woman you gave me was the source of this. So you already have, already you have the breaking of communion between the man and the woman, and you have this mutual uh, condemnation that starts happening right in the early pages. Whereas before, bef when they had no shame, essentially the man and woman were able to say to themselves, if I can quote the litur liturgical line, this is my body given for you. Ephesians 5.28, Paul says, Husbands have a duty to love their wives as their own bodies. 
We shame our wife. We shame our bodies. We break the, 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 the communion. And then finally, uh, he brings out the spousal meaning of the body. And this is another interesting one because the basic design of the human is for marriage. Now, the minute you said it in the modern world, it sounds like you're being, uh, it sounds almost like controversial. But in fact, all of us come from marriages. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily in all the perfect, beautiful ways it should, but we all come from, from unions. And uh, one of the things that happened in recent years is that like Mother's Day, Father's Day, have lo a lot of churches, I don't know about yours, but have been eliminated. No reference to Mother's Day, Father's Day. Because if you have someone stand up in the church and say, you know, all mothers stand up or whatever, then people feel like left out because they're not mothers or whatever. And that's so the church is kind of uh, eliminated. But it's also, it's a sign of the whole inward gaze. When you ask the question, you know, are you a mother? And you're ashamed if you're not or whatever. Rather than recognizing we all have mothers. We all have fathers. We See, that the problem is we look the wrong direction. The, the problem only came up when we began to look inward at ourselves. And so the church has always found out ways to celebrate our motherhood, the mothers and fathers, even if we ourselves were single. So the temporary world, and, and you'll, you, we all know this, of course, to be true, but has set the genders at war with each other in all kinds of destructive ways. And so we ourselves have been caught up in the war of the genders. And of course, there's so many important things the church needs to say and to teach and to clarify that are really important, for, particularly for empowering women for ministry. It's very, very important to Asbury and to, I think, our vision for the church. But there's also many, many destructive ways in which this has been unfolded in the world. Well, I'm going to have to wrap it up here, otherwise we won't get any lunch. Uh, but one of the great things about the, uh, the way this comes together is that uh, John Paul is trying to help us to think deeply about things uh, and the theology and the original design of creation. And so hopefully as we go through these series, we'll, we'll explore more and more issues and unfold a lot of this. I'm sorry to think about this further. There's a wonderful man named Christopher West. We have him on the Orlando, I um, mean the Wilmore campus. And Christopher West is given himself to traveling around the country, around the world, introducing Protestants in particular to the theology of the body. There's, it's now spread across the whole country. There are literally churches all over the world learning about the theology of the body. And so this is our, our makeup time. So what have we learned? We've, we've learned, I hope, today that we have a lot of theological work to do. We can't go to quick solutions. We need to be thoughtful and to really recover God's original design. We do that technically going back to the beginning, examine the original design and realize it's still intact, even in a post-fallen world. And we learned a lot about our idea of original solitude, our longing for communion, and this, this press of the fallen world to push us to autonomous solitude happens in a thousand ways in our culture. We talked about the, the mystery of our original nakedness, the original design, we're tending to live without fear or shame. And redemption is deeply tied to overturning fear and shame as well as guilt. I went into the uh, Princeton Library some years ago. I've written a, a good bit on the area of shame and the cross because the, the cross of Christ, if you look at the, the death of Christ, uh, it's actually only a verse, one verse in the, New in the New Testament or in the Gospels. It's just one, even in one case, and I think it's Luke, only half of one verse, the actual death of Christ. But you have chapters and chapters and chapters of the passion, the suffering, the beating, the mocking, the hitting the face, the mock coronation, all these things, because Christ is bearing their shame. In Western theologies, Christ could have died like in a closet somewhere. But that's not what the New Testament gives us. There's a bearing of shame that's part of the overturning of Genesis, the, the fall. Anyway, all this is being brought out in, in these early homilies. And then, of course, the last espousal mean the body which in marriage and childbirth reflects the Trinity. A man and woman are married, one flesh, give birth to a child. We have the reflection of the Trinity right in the inner family circle. And that, of course, has huge implications for where we're headed. And the fact that God himself is a sweet society, we ourselves become sweet societies. We'll leave it there for now. Pick up this next time. 
and hope that this has stimulated some thoughts. And we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, during lunch to talk about this some more. But thank you for uh, giving yourself to this, these reflections. Let's pray. Well, we thank you for the amazing gift of your word to us and for these thoughts that have been given to us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless it and enable us, Lord, to hear it deeply in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.